If there's one thing I like more than watching my dad get disqualified from Little League Baseball games for being a full-grown man, then it'd definitely have to be playing video games. I mean, there's ass loads of different reasons as to why they're so great, whether it be for the challenge, the stories you could experience, everything about the Soldier game, or all of the above. However, even if all the boxes of what makes a game great are all checked off, it doesn't mean doodly squat if your controller sucks, and in all my years of gaming, I've come across some of the best and worst there've ever been. And since my wife Chili asked me to leave her alone with a cable guy for a few days so they could fix the TV again, I decided to use my spare time to make a tier list for every gaming controller in history that I'm qualified to talk about. So sit back in your favorite YouTube viewing chair, frame your uncle for a petty crime, press the subscribe button if you haven't already, and allow me, the fourth best t-ball player in my neighborhood, Cameron All One Word, to tell you my gaming controller tier list. But before I begin, though, let me clarify that my criteria is mainly going to come down to my personal preferences, and even though I'm not going to take nostalgia into consideration per se, I am going to be judging these controllers based on how good they are for playing the game libraries of the consoles they were made for. So without further ado, let's start with the F tier, with the absolute worst controllers in human history. Every Mad Cat's controller ever. Alright, I'm gonna try sticking to real controllers for the rest of the video, but I've hated these things for decades, and I don't get a whole lot of chances to bury them, so you'd better believe I'm gonna ride Mad Cat's asses right about now. We all know third-party controllers usually aren't as good due to the fact that they're slightly cheaper, but whenever a new console comes out, Mad Cat's can't seem to help themselves in making the most ass-backwards controllers possible. I'm sure there were probably patents that prevented third parties from making controllers that looked too similar to the real deal, but even with that restriction in mind, I'm pretty sure a diabetic horse jockey could have done a better job. Thankfully, third-party retro controllers are pretty spot-on these days, and sometimes even better than the originals. But sadly, for fine companies like Retro Fighters, third-party controllers are always gonna have a bad stigma thanks to the buttholes at Mad Cat's. And seeing how Mad Cat's controllers really are the worst things ever, you can't really compare them to any other controllers. So let's skip the E tier for some reason and jump right into the D tier, where the controllers do still suck, but at least they're not Mad Cat's. The Atari 5200 controller. Alright, so this is the only controller on the list that I've never actually used myself, but I mean, <laughs> come on, look at this thing, how am I not gonna make fun of it? To be fair, I can't really be too hard on this controller, seeing as how pretty much everything about the 5200 sucks, so it's not like the controller ruined something that would have otherwise been fun. Plus, for the kinds of lame-ass games that were on this console anyway, it does look like it worked just fine, and not that this makes a difference, but this controller was made super early in video game history, so it would kind of feel like a dick to rip on it too hard, because nobody in the video game industry really had any idea what was going on. The original Xbox controller. I've never owned an original Xbox, so admittedly, I don't really have a whole lot of experience with this controller, but from playing Halo and my buddy Lonnie Seller, I could definitely say that this controller was a bit much. First of all, it's even bigger than my mom's ass, so unless you're the great Kali, you're probably gonna get carpal tunnel after playing for like two minutes. And on top of that, this is the first controller on the list out of many that's got the shit D-pad that's basically just one giant button as opposed to an up, down, left, and right being four separate entities. To be honest, it's not terribly uncomfortable or anything like that, but the thing that really knocks this controller down the list is the fact that it has a mandatory extension cord for some reason. And I don't care what kind of asinine defense someone comes up with in the comments for this, the only thing I could really say about this faulty design choice is... The Kinect. Alright, much like the original Xbox controller, I really don't have a whole lot of playtime with this. Probably about 20 to 30 minutes if I'm being honest, so I can't really say too much about it. But what I can tell you about the Kinect is that while it is actually pretty impressive, it's honestly just completely unnecessary and I just didn't find it very fun. As much as I don't like this controller, if you could even call it that though, I will give Microsoft credit for being a little more subtle in copying Nintendo than Sony was. As far as the PlayStation Move's concerned though, I've literally only held it in my hand, and since I'm kind of pushing it with not having experience with the rest of the controllers in the D tier, I'm gonna spare Sony the roasting here, even though me saying all that's kind of just putting the move in the D tier anyway. But anyway, let's keep on trucking with the C tier though, where I'm pretty sure I'm gonna piss a lot of people off. The Xbox 360 controller. Finally, a Microsoft controller I've actually got a lot of experience with, and it's meh. I know a lot of people prefer this over the PS3 controller because they're hung up over the placement of the analog sticks, but personally, I think both analog stick placements are just fine. My main issue with the 360 controller, though, is that while it is still much better than the original Xbox controller, they kept that god-awful one-button D-pad, which doesn't bother me for 3D games, I guess, but this is completely unacceptable for 2D games, and this is the era where they started making a comeback, so I couldn't help but be hot and bothered over it. The Nintendo 64 controller. You might think nostalgia should prevent this from being so low, but if I'm being honest, nostalgia is actually the driving factor as to why it's in the C tier. I mean, playing the Nintendo 64 as a dumbass little kid with dirty hands was actually the first time I noticed how important controllers actually were. And look, I'm sure designing one of the first controllers for 3D gaming was probably pretty tough, so I do give Nintendo a lot of credit for trying. I mean, there's actually a lot of really good ideas here, especially the Rumble Pack, but at the end of the day, the design's pretty friggin' brutal. I mean, come on, Nintendo, what's the deal with there being three handles? 
It's way too big to hold from the sides, and if you hold it in the middle like you're supposed to for most games, then there's this piece of dead weight hanging off the side for some reason. It's definitely not bad enough to where you wouldn't want to play the 64. In fact, for the 64's game library, it's actually not a bad controller at all. It's just more disappointing than anything else, but I will say that it's pretty cool that there's an ass load of different colorways to choose from. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people ripping my ass apart in the comments over this, and that's fine, but if the controller wasn't so underwhelming, then Nintendo would've used a similar design for the controllers that came later on. One thing I will give these controllers, though, is that there were at least a lot of cool colors to choose from. The three-button Genesis controller. This controller works fine for most Genesis games, but it was so bad for fighting games that they actually had to make an entirely new controller altogether. And while the D-pad's not quite as merged as other controllers, the diagonal buttons are still noticeable enough to make me cry. And if I'm being honest, this controller just doesn't feel like Sega realized how important it was to make a good controller at all. I mean, it's fine, I guess, but it still left a lot of room for improvement aside from the buttons. The six-button Genesis controller. Well, I mean, I guess this is better than the Genesis's three-button controller, but it's still not a B-tier player to me, because one, I don't really play fighting games anyway, and two, I'm sorry, I, I, I really, really don't like these kinds of D-pads. If you ask me, they could frig right off. The Sega Saturn controller. This is pretty much the same deal as the last two controllers, except now there's L and R buttons, but I'm not really a big fan of them, because they don't even go in when you press them, so it just kind of feels like every controller's broken or something. The L and R buttons aren't really a problem on the Japanese controller, but the trade-off is that the rest of the buttons are even looser than my wife Chili. <laughs> Whatever the scriptwriter means by that. The original PS1 controller. As we all know, the PS1 eventually improved its controller with the DualShock, but seeing how that's just a PlayStation 2 controller that we somehow got a few years before the actual console, I'm just gonna count that for the PS2. As far as the standard PS1 controller goes, though, I actually love it as long as I'm not playing games that benefit from the analog sticks. In fact, I'm fine with this controller for pretty much everything besides Ape Escape. It looks cool, feels great in your dirty-ass hands, and should you throw a temper tantrum, it's durable enough to where you're probably not gonna break it unless you're playing Barbie Explorer. At the end of the day, though, it isn't always well be the shit PS1 controller, so sadly, it's gotta go in the C tier. The Wii Remote. I know a lot of people hate this controller, and if you do, that's fine, but if you ask me, I think this might be the most underrated controller ever. Sure, it does suck for a lot of games even with the nunchuck since it only has one analog stick, but when developers built games with the Wii Remote in mind, it actually led to some pretty unique experiences sometimes. And even when games did use standard controls, it honestly wasn't even that bad usually, and I kinda thought the speaker that played low-quality sound effects was pretty cool too. And since the Wii Remote's only truly great for very specific games, I can in good conscience place it higher than the C tier. Assuming you haven't rage quit the video yet though, let's move on to the B tier where things are starting to get hot and steamy. The Wii Classic Controller. This one's a bit tricky, because my main complaint about the Wii Remote is that while it is great for specific kinds of games in its library, it's pretty lackluster for others. But even though the classic controller straight up doesn't even work for most of the Wii's library, the true purpose for this thing was mainly just for the WiiWare, and more specifically, virtual console titles. As far as those games are concerned, this thing's pretty goddamn perfect. It might not be ideal for 64 games, but then again, I didn't really care a whole lot about that original controller anyway, so I had no problem playing through Majora's Mask with this bad boy whatsoever. And even though this weird-ass button on the top's probably never been used for for anything, it's still pretty fun to press for no reason whatsoever, and it's not like it's in the way or anything. The Sega Saturn Control Pad. To the best of my knowledge, this controller was specifically made for Nights into Dreams, but to me, I just think it's an overall better Saturn controller in general. It might be a little beefy for a controller, but at least there's an analog stick here, albeit a primitive one, and the L and R buttons actually go down when you press them, unlike the other Saturn controllers. In fact, not only did they actually go down, but I'm pretty sure this is the first controller that introduced the more sensitive spring triggers into the shoulder buttons. I know you probably think I'm an idiot for putting this in a higher tier than the 64 controller with a silly analog stick such as thus, but the Saturn doesn't have games like Mario 64 that really need an analog stick in the first place, you dingo. And as for the rest of the Saturn library that doesn't use it, it's still a nice bonus to have. The Hori Pad Mini. I don't really care all that much about third-party controllers aside from Mad Cats because I like to put them down with negativity whenever possible and Retro Fighters because they're doing God's work. But to me, the Hori Pad Mini made playing the 64 decades later a lot better. I know Hori's made a lot of officially licensed third-party controllers over the years, and they're usually pretty good, but in my opinion, the only time they've ever actually surpassed the original console was with the 64, so this is the only one I really have time for on this list. To the best of my knowledge, this Japanese exclusive controller was pretty much made for Smash Bros. after the GameCube was already a thing, which should explain why players love the rubber analog stick that feels pretty much like the GameCube controller. But regardless of which 64 game you use this controller for, I actually prefer it for the entire library. The Atari 2600 controller. I know you're probably thinking, this controller's more simplistic than the Season 2 box set of Who's the Boss with the third disc being replaced with the Jurassic Park bonus features. And honestly, I wouldn't even say that you're wrong, but if we're talking about playing the Atari 2600, then there's no other controller you'd want to use other than this iconic joystick and single button. 
I mean, not that you'd ever want to play the Atari 2600 anyway, because 98% of the library is absolute trash in the modern day, but the controller was at least perfect for what it was meant for. And for whatever it's worth, it also works on a Sega Genesis for some reason, which further supports my theory that Sega didn't fully understand the importance of a good controller back then, seeing as how they just copied Atari's homework and added some bells and whistles. The Wii U Gamepad. Oh, I know I'm gonna get buried to hell for putting this in the B tier above the 64 and Xbox 360 controllers, but honestly, I don't think the Wii U gamepad was actually bad. I mean, it's pretty big and even slightly heavy, but it's honestly pretty damn comfortable to hold, and even though most games don't even care that there's a second screen in your hands, but the games that do, like the highly underrated Nintendo Land, are actually pretty awesome. However, even though I think the Wii U gamepad was pretty underrated, it definitely wasn't necessary to force onto a console, and it's hilarious that Nintendo, honest to god, thought this would attract hardcore gamers. Not to mention the fact that it chugs batteries faster than my neighbor Terry chugs cough medicine. The Wii U Pro Controller. Short story even shorter, holding this controller feels incredible. I know people get pretty hung up on the placement analog sticks, but like I said earlier, I don't really care where they are, as long as my thumbs can reach them, I'm a happy full-grown man. The only reason I didn't place this higher is because while it is perfect for 97% of the Wii U's game library, there's actually a few titles it won't work with. And to be honest, the fact that this controller even existed is kind of depressing, because it just proves that nobody wanted anything to do with the gamepad besides me, and even I didn't want that much to do with it. Oh well, at least it held a good charge, I guess. The Joy-Cons. I know the frequency of Joy-Con drifts lame as hell, but for the sake of this list, I'm just gonna assume that they're working properly. And with that being said, I actually kinda feel bad for not placing these higher, cause there's really nothing wrong with them. But whenever you're playing Switch games with friends or enemies and there's not enough Pro Controllers to go around, you definitely don't want to be one of the jabronis stuck with one Joy-Con. And God forbid if you're stuck with one Joy-Con while playing Mario Kart 8 like I was this one time. If I'm being honest, I actually don't feel like it made me play any worse, but it just didn't feel right, damn it. And even when you're using the default mini thingy that comes with the Switch, it still feels pretty bush league compared to other controllers. I mean, it's completely fine, but much like how you don't want your friends to see you with Cocoa Nuggets instead of Cocoa Pebbles, you really are just gonna wish you had a Pro Controller unless you're playing Snipper Clips or something. Let's move on to the A tier, though, and start raising some hell around here. The Virtual Boy Controller. The Virtual Boy was a terrible console, but I'm dead serious, this controller feels outstanding in your hands. It's a shame they didn't make more games that fully utilize this controller, or better yet that this controller wasn't just for another console, but be that as it may, this is probably one of the best 2D gaming controllers I've ever had the pleasure of operating. The Dreamcast Controller. Why the cord's on the bottom of the controller, the world may never know, but at least you could lock it into the back so it's not really in the way, and even though it was Sega's last console, I'm genuinely happy they finally figured out how to make a D-pad without diagonal buttons. The comfort of the controller left room for improvement, but it still feels pretty good, and while it does suck to play 3D games with one analog stick, most games at the time worked just fine regardless, plus the VMU memory card was pretty ahead of its time. Not only does it display things during gameplay like health, but it also had mini-games for a lot of titles that you could play on the go, which is one of the many reasons why I don't think I'll ever sell my Dreamcast. The NES Controller There's not a whole lot to say about this controller, but sometimes simple's the best option, especially on a console with relatively simplistic games. And if you look at all the dingus controllers that came before this, it's actually pretty impressive that it turned out as well as it did. The NES Dogbone Controller this is made for the AV Famicom, aka the NES Top Loader, and the only real difference is the shape and button placement. Personally, I just prefer how this feels in your hands even though I don't have one anymore, and I know that some people don't like that the A and B buttons are slightly diagonal, but to be honest, I don't really notice either way, I just think the Dogbone controller feels an ass hair better. The Super Nintendo Controller even without all the hand grooves we've grown accustomed to in recent years, the next logical step in controllers meant for 2D gaming after the NES feels great. Still relatively simplistic, but for the games that it's meant for, it's everything that it needs to be. Well, I do wish there were more colorways to choose from, both the Super Nintendo and Super Famicom designs look awesome. And I don't know about you, but the L and R buttons blew my mind as a kid, and surprisingly, they added a lot to the gameplay as well. The GameCube Controller while the 64 taught me how important controllers truly are, this was the first controller that made me realize how good they could actually be. First of all, there's plenty of colorways to choose from which I always love, and the grooves in the L and R buttons in particular made me rock hard. And the C-Stick, while not a real analog stick, was a welcome addition, and it worked great for controlling cameras. And while the sensitive L and R buttons are badass, I have no idea why Nintendo doesn't put them on their controllers anymore. My one and only gripe with the GameCube controller, though, is the placement of the A, B, X, and Y buttons that work fine for most games, but for the Mega Man X collection, it's just god-awful. I know it's not fair to hold Super Nintendo ROMs against the entire GameCube controller, but if I'm being honest, I kinda don't like the idea of these buttons having different sizes to begin with. It looks cool and nostalgic and everything, don't get me wrong, but it just doesn't feel like it was the right idea if you're trying to push game controller design forward. And I know the controller works fine for every game in the GameCube library that's not a compilation, but the design here makes me feel like Nintendo really believed that 2D games were a thing of the past. And I don't know, I just kinda thought that this was the point in time where controllers should've tried to be good for every kind of game. 
I'm almost positive I'm gonna get a lot of poo-poo and pee-pee in the comments for not putting this controller in the S tier, but you know what? I'm not gonna lie just so we can hang out later, okay? The PlayStation 2 controller. Honestly, I think this controller's damn near perfect, especially for any PS2 game. In fact, I actually almost placed it higher. But the only thing that kept me from doing that are the lack of grooves and sensitive L and R buttons, really. The PS3 controller. This controller added sensitive L and R buttons like I asked, and Sony did go and ask here further and make it wireless, but the only bad things I really have to say about this controller is that things got better in the S tier. So let's not waste any more time and dive right into the S tier with my favorite controllers ever. The PS4, Xbox One, and Switch Pro controllers. Oh, I'm certain there's riots all over the place in the comments right now, but while all three current-gen controllers have pros and cons, I still find them to be the best three controllers ever. They've all got pretty much the same button layout, aside from the PS4's analog sticks that are placed slightly lower, but as I mentioned earlier, I really don't have a preference as to where the analog sticks are one way or another. However, the first key advantage the PlayStation 4 controller has over the other two is the light in the back that changes colors for various reasons, like to represent your health and things like that. Then there's the speaker that adds sound effects to games, which can only be seen as an advantage since you could just turn it off if you don't like it. And then finally, the touchpad, which does hog a good chunk of the controller, but honestly, it never gets in the way for me whatsoever, and I actually do use it for typing sometimes. As for my gripes with this controller, though, it is mildly annoying how weak the battery life is, and while I do think it's great to hold, it's not even comparable to the other two controllers in this tier, and I also think it's the ugliest of the three as well, because there's just way too much going on for my liking. While I do like wacky colorway options, which all three do have, albeit far less on the Switch somehow, I generally prefer a more simplistic and straightforward controller most of the time, which is exactly why I like the designs for the Switch Pro controller and Xbox One. To be honest, I've never actually owned an Xbox One, but for the little amount of time that I played it, I can't deny that the controller's damn near perfect aside from the fact that it friggin' takes batteries even though it came out in late 2013. But even though the controller does lose a lot of points for that, it still lasts a lot longer than the PS4 controller, so I guess I can't really complain too much. Like I mentioned earlier, I've never been a fan of Microsoft's controllers in the past, but they really hit it out of the park with the Xbox One by finally adding an actual D-pad. Plus, the way the controller's grooves fit in your hand is probably the most comfortable I ever found a controller to be. Not far behind that, though, is the Switch Pro controller, which fits just as good to me, and depending on which day you ask me, I might even say it feels a little better than the Xbox One controller. But beyond the perfect fit, which is pretty much a coin toss between the Switch Pro controller and Xbox One anyway, there's also the built-in gyro controls, which some people see as gimmicky, but in games that require aiming, I find it to be a thousand times more convenient, and if you don't like it then, you could usually turn it off anyway, so at worst it doesn't hurt. And not only does the battery last as long as the Xbox One controller, but you also don't need to use butthole batteries either. And I have no idea what the frig's going on inside this thing, but the HD rumble's the best feeling ever for whatever reason. As much as I love the Switch Pro controller though, there are two huge missing features that make Nintendo complete morons for leaving out. The first thing is the fact that the ZL and ZR buttons don't even have springs, which, as I mentioned earlier, could really add a lot to certain games. And what makes this missing feature even more disappointing is the fact that Nintendo actually had it on the GameCube controller in 2001, and for whatever reason, they just never brought it back. And whenever I see people on the internet asking for an HD remake for Super Mario Sunshine, I just get sad, because I don't see any way how it could work without a GameCube controller to control Flood's water pressure. The second missing feature that Nintendo are absolute wieners for leaving out on the Pro Controller, though, is the friggin' headphone jack. Never mind the fact that the relegating headset support through your goddamn cell phone, but even something as simple as wanting to wear headphones during a game is strictly forbidden on the Pro Controller. But as idiotic as this is, it doesn't really bother me a whole lot since you could just plug a headphone extension into the console and I don't even want to talk to strangers online anyway. Well, not after what happened last time at least. So with that being said, my main complaint with this controller comes down to the lack of springs for the ZL and ZR buttons, so if I had to rank these controllers even though they're all in the S tier, I'd have to give the Switch Pro controller the nod only slightly ahead of the Xbox One controller, mainly due to the gyro controls and HD rumble. And as much as I do like the PS4 controller, it doesn't feel quite as good in my hands as either of the other two competing controllers. Plus, it's still ugly as hell even though it's my third favorite controller of all time. But anyway, that's my list. We've got every Mad Cat's controller ever in the F tier all by itself where it belongs. The Kinect Atari 5200 and the original X Xbox controllers in the D tier. The Xbox 360, Nintendo 64, Sega Saturn, PS1, Wii Remote, and both Genesis controllers in the C tier. The Wii Classic, Saturn Control Pad, Hori Pad Mini, Atari 2600, Wii U Gamepad, Wii U Pro Controller, and Joy-Cons in the B tier. Virtual Boy somehow, Dreamcast, NES, NES Dogbone, Super Nintendo, GameCube, PS2, and PS3 in the A tier. And finally, the PS4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch Pro Controller in the S tier. I've never really played any PC games besides Sim Ant, so it wouldn't be fair for me to judge the keyboard and mouse combo since I'd probably hate it even if I tried it, even though I'm sure it's probably the best if you get used to it. 
And I also didn't mention any handhelds aside from the Virtual Boy, since they technically don't have their own controllers, even though the Wii U gamepad's damn near a handheld. But anyway, how would you arrange your controller tier list, though? Am I a complete moron for not putting anything nostalgic into the S tier, or do you think I did an alright job here? Either way, let me know what you think in the comments below, and as always, I'll try my goddamnedest to respond to everybody. But let me tell you, if there's two people who could easily be in the S Plus tier if they decided to become controllers, then it would definitely be today's patrons of the day, Jason and El Gringo. If you want to be badasses like these two, then consider supporting supporting FU Game Crew on Patreon for loot boxes in the mail and other wacky rewards. And if you want to make a cameo, then send pictures or videos of you rocking any FU Game Crew merch like these legendary human beings you see before you. As always, like and share this video anywhere on the internet to help this channel grow. And if you want to prove that you're not down with registered sex offenders, then go ahead and press the subscribe button if you haven't already. My name's Cameron All One Word, and I'll be back with more videos soon. So I want to say thank you to your loyalty, thank you for your support.